Dr. Sue, I am actually just preparing to give you a slideshow um, study guide for exam one. I understand there's a lot of anxiety in the group that is completely normal. Um, you really don't know what to expect about how the exams are set up for our class. This is your first semester of nursing school, so I'm sure there's a lot of anxiety. Um, originally, I, I'm not a fan of study guides per se. Actually, Dr. Ignatavius, who writes the advanced med surge textbook that our school uses, Donna is her first name. Uh, I went to her um, three-day um, conference last year, and um, the nurse educators in the room actually all agreed that most of them don't give out study guides for each exam. Um, I suggest to you that you use your other study materials, but I understand that it may be reassuring to you to have the study guide. So I'm going to talk through just a few slides here. This is just a 10 or 15 minute presentation to kind of just outline the high points of what you should be looking at. One of the things I just want to say is that you all really need to take ownership of some of the, um, you know, uh, self-study, the readings, uh, reviews that have been provided for you. I do have a bit of a concern because overall, as I look at the first three quizzes, the group as a whole has not um, gleaned 190 to 100% of the points on your quizzes. And that concerns me because you're able to use all of your resources and you have a half hour to complete 10 questions. And um, when you can page through your textbook, you can look at all your PowerPoints, you can look at all your notes, and you're still not getting, you know, close to all of the questions correct. That's a little bit of a concern to me. So um, with that said, I think everyone needs to just do a little self-reflection and say, am I really taking my time? Am I ready for the quizzes when I take them? Do I have my materials organized in front of me or am I rushing at the last minute? So I think that's that would behoove you. It would behoove you to um, make sure that you're doing those things. Okay, so let's get started. Um, first of all, you want to review the way that drugs are named. There are going to be a number of questions on the test having you identified generic versus trade. Um, you should also understand what chemical names are and what they look like, um, but we usually don't test as much on the chemical as we do on generic and trade name understandings. Uh, for the phases of uh, pharmacokinetics, um, I had you do the exercise where each group looked at absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And there are several points for each of those processes that you need to understand. What kinds of things can affect absorption? You should be looking at bioavailability and some of the other terms that we use. You should also understand the organ systems where each of these primarily take place. Also, with your patients, you need to know how do I tell whether that organ system is healthy or not? You should understand the basic lab values that we use to actually evaluate, you know, whether or not the patient has good health of those organs or whether they're compromised. So you need to know which each of these does, where each works, the changes that can impact these actions. Older adults and children, remember I told you at both ends of the spectrum, how can that affect um, these processes either way. Also taking medication with or without food, how does that impact each phase, the liver function and kidney function that's important, and the reasons why. You need to understand drug to drug interactions, what does that mean, what do we mean when we say loading dose and why do we give loading doses. Protein binding. Remember, those that are highly protein binding medications, if we a patient has more than one of those that um, has high protein binding, you can have toxicity of one or the other because they're going to compete for the, for the proteins. So please review that. You should also understand that first pass effect and understand that, again, that relates to bioavailability of the medication. And remember that the intravenous route is the only route that guarantees us 100% bioavailability. Receptors, you need to understand either the selective or the non-selective and what makes them that way and which receptors 
are the key for each of the um, the uh, pro the major categories that we um, look at for the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Also, you should understand what MEC means. Remember looking at that range of the drug entering the body and where we go from therapeutic to toxic levels. Understand water-soluble versus fat-soluble. Know that fat-soluble form cannot be excreted from the body through the kidneys, so our body has to convert it, right? Um, we metabolize the drug before we can get rid of it through the liver. Okay, understanding half-life, you should also practice half-life mathematics on because um, there will be a question about that. Um, peak and trough levels, what are they used for? Um, paradoxical effects with, of a medication, you should understand that term. That means the opposite of what we expect to see. We talked about teratogenic effects. And then all the other words that you see here, they should be at least familiar to you. Some of the important concepts that you should understand also are things like toxicity levels. Where are the meds toxic? So what does it mean to be ototoxic? Okay, how, what does that affect? That affects the ear, the patient's hearing, right? They can have ringing in their ears. They can have hearing loss. We have medications that if we administer them too rapidly, um, such as diuretics like IV Lasix, if we give that too rapidly, they can, that can cause ototoxicity. We have some antibiotics that can cause ototoxicity. Nephrotoxic, what does that mean? Obviously, nephro is the kidney, so we can damage someone's kidneys by giving certain medications. And then, of course, hepatotoxic, hepato would be the liver. So please review those. Um, how do nurses ensure security of opioids? We know that there's rules about that. Also, you should know the controlled substance, what makes them a certain level on the controlled substance um, schedule. Um, it's their level of propensity to be addicting. Um, before we go too much further, too, you do need to go back and review historically what the major um, agencies surrounding drugs, um, what their action, what they do, and when they, uh, when these agencies came into being. So, for example, the FDA. Okay, um, look back at that history slide, review that, understand what the DEA is and what what their functions are, things like the Nurse Practice Act, the fact that that's something that's state by state, and we reviewed that for the state of Wisconsin. And how does that impact you as the nurse? Another thing I want you to scan is just, just briefly scan through Chapter 4. You should understand, we did mention it throughout our lectures when we talked about the patient um, information and history that you get. What are they taking besides meds? Remember I said you have to recognize that they don't think that over-the-counter preps or herbs or vitamin um, supplements are actually going to uh, have to be mentioned. So you need to make sure patient, that you get that information on how do the herbal supplements affect the way that our bodies absorb meds. Just scan chapter 4. It was in your readings for competency 1, but I want you to review that. And then um, of course, going on with the assessments, besides if they're taking any of those herbal supplements, you also need to look at um, things in their history that could clue you as far as their drug administration, um, what you anticipate for each patient. Again, I mentioned before, but I'm going to say it again, understanding, remember the extremes of age, the very young and the very old, and special considerations. Looking specifically at the autonomic nervous system, you want to look at, of course, the S or the stress side. That's our fight or flight side of the nervous system, of the autonomic nervous system. Remember, I call the autonomic nervous system the automatic. And then the parasympathetic, of course, nervous system side is our peace symbol, if you think of peace side. Um, so look at those uh, two very carefully, and it lists each of the things that we want you to review. Understand what it means to be either an agonist or an antagonist. You have to understand basically what that means. And the adrenergic side, and then, of course, the cholinergic side is the parasympathetic. So you need to make sure you understand those two sides. And then go through and look at the different um, 
receptors, the different en enzymes that we're trying to affect, and the outcomes for the patient. Okay, so you need to understand what is a beta agon antagonist and uh, what is it going to do. Okay, um, what is an alpha antagonist and what is that going to do. So what will you see in your patients. Okay, a lowered heart rate or um, increased urine output if a patient is taking the alpha antagonist. Same thing on the parasympathetic side. Look at the parasympathomimetic, the agonist. We look at the cholinergic and the muscarinic receptors. Remember, those are the two main receptors for the PNS. Okay, so we want that. You look at, there is a, this is a nomenclature I did not mention before. It's like an algorithm or like a little clue for you. It's the word sludge. That reminds you of the cholinergic meds. So what is sludge? Salivation, lacrimation, urination, diarrhea, GI distress, and emesis. So it just gives you a clue. Um, with the anticholinergics, anticholinergics, if you think of it, of course we know atropine is still considered the um, one that we focus on for anticholinergics. It is... It, it was more commonly given as a preoperative medication to dry secretions. Um, can't see, can't spit, can't pee, can't poo. So patients will have blurring of their vision, dryness. If you think about um, the fact that they won't make secretions, and so that's the reason why it historically it's been used preoperatively so that patients don't have excess of secretions in the airway. And then make sure you're looking at the muscarinic blockers. Now, um, the other things that we want you to look up and review are specific things about contraindications associated with it, adrenergic drugs, and what do those include. I'm giving you a few questions in here just so that you can kind of go through and answer them for yourself. What do these drugs do and what are the side effects, not only the side effects, but the adverse effects. So side effects can be acceptable, adverse effects are not. And so you need to make sure you know the differences. Which receptors are the cholinergic medications acting on? What's impacted by the alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2? Which organs, etc.? What's the difference between direct and indirect acting cholinergics? How do they affect our body systems, GI, vision or eyes, um, urinary and cardiovascular? And what impact will those adrenergic drugs have on the cholinergic, um, or excuse me, what effect will the adrenergic drugs have on the cardiovascular system? We have to think about that. And also look at myasthenia gravis, it's in your textbook. Look at the one medication that we treat with for that particular condition. And what is our goal? Why do we use this and how, well, how does it help the patients? You know, it has to do with their muscle strength, okay, because these patients have very weak muscles throughout their body over time. So the medication is given to them to counteract that so that they tend to have a better muscle tone. And um, that is, there's a lot of positive effects from that then. This chart is just something that um, basically, whoop, let me go back to it. The chart is just for you to kind of review and it goes through the same types of things as what we've already talked about. They give you little cliche comments. Um, I'm not a big fan of this. I took it actually out of, I think this is kind of crude. Basically just understand that the anticholinergics dry you. And so if you think about your, you get hot, you get dry, you can get red, um, you know, that can cause, um, agri you know, you can become irritated um, and uh, you can have problems with your sight. Um, we never give these with glaucoma. And we also have some medications, obviously, that we don't give in this situation. For example, people who have um, asthma. So like propranolol, we wouldn't give to someone who has asthma. And you need to just look at that. Those are all in your book. So the last thing I'm going to say here is that all of you, it's understandable to be anxious, but I want you to think through, use your self-studies, use your questions in the back of the um, ATI ebook that I gave you. Those are very good questions. Also go into Evolve and do the practice tests. I think that's the more questions you can expose yourself to, the better off you are. 
Um, and just suffice it to say that just test taking skills alone, look at each question for what they're asking you and look at your given answers and select what you can see as the best answer. Okay, there are a few questions on there that are select all that apply. So make sure that you are careful about looking at that when you see select all that apply. You need to, uh, maybe sometimes there's only one right answer, but most of the time there are multiple ones that you have to choose. Um, so other than that, um, I wish you the best of luck. We will, I will also be putting up the, once I review all of the med cards, uh, you'll see a folder that'll show up with the med cards in them and um, those can be additional things for you to review. Uh, thank you very much.